What's going on, Wolfpack? My name is Denarik Wolf, and welcome to some more Bosnia Reacts to Geography Now, Tunisia this time. Okay, the country is, by the way, Tunisia. The capital city is Tunis. I get those two mixed up all the time. I don't know why. Um, but sometimes I would call this the country of Tunis, but no, 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 it's the capital city. But then again, the demonym of somebody from Tunisia and or Tunis is simply referred to as Tunisian. But um, this country, uh, despite its fairly modest size in Northern Africa today, uh, it's actually the smallest uh, North African country, as a matter of fact, but it has quite the tale to tell. Well, I guess Egypt would too, but uh, Tunis as well. Okay, but it's very interesting. It has a very interesting history. It was once one of the most powerful countries in all of the Mediterranean, really. And uh, here we are today is where the Arab Spring started. So let's see how we got to here. So the Arab world is pretty complex. You have the Middle East, the Gulf, the Arab speaking but not completely considered Arab regions, and finally the Maghreb or North Africa. Within each of these communities you find hints and links to what shaped their identity over millennia. And Tunisia is a very complicated one. At some point all of these empires and kingdoms left their mark on Tunisia. Wait, I see Vandals on that list. They are from Scandinavia, so like proto-Vikings? Eh, nah, they were Germanic, not Norse, so uh, see, so what they were just saying there that the Vikings were their own thing, Nordics or Norse people, and not really Germanic. Well, mm, uh, how, how would we define that really? Because if you tell me Germanic, I think of a Germanic speaking tribe, like the Vandals were, like the Goths were. And yes, the Vikings themselves, well, Vikings were just a group of people that went on a Viking or a or on travels, they were basically raiders or plunderers, but uh, there were settled people in the area too. It's not all, they didn't have a Viking culture, okay? They had a Nordic culture, but they spoke a Germanic based language. So <laughs> I would say, yeah, yeah, I still count them as Germanic regardless. And nowadays when we, we hear Nordic, we think of, of course, uh, many countries like uh, Sweden, Norway, even Finland, which is which are a Uralic people, by the way, long story. Uh, so, I don't know. And we would, of course, yeah, those as the Nordics or the Norse people. But they still speak a Germanic-based language. Even the Swedes and the Norwegians, a Northern Germanic language. So that's that's hard. I, I still would count the Vikings as Germanic. Well, I wouldn't say that. Well, Vikings in Africa. No, I mean, well, I mean, technically, yes, the Vikings in the 11th century were taking over, but we're talking about 5th century Vandals. They're not the same thing. Wait, you mean the uh, Punic Vandalism. Wars? No, that was centuries earlier between Rome and Carthage. So you're saying that Lebanese people fought Rome. What? No, well, I mean, unless you're referring to both having Phoenician roots, but why do they have hamams? Are they Turkish? And why are they speaking French? And aren't they Muslim and they're drinking wine? Is that allowed? Tunisia, everybody. Let's start the episode. It's time to learn geography. Now! Hey everybody, I'm your host, Barbs. Get your Geography Now merch at geographynow.com. It's not selling one? out if it's your brand. <laughs> oh, and what is this cool Tunisia flag shirt that I'm wearing with the logo? It's from unityshirtshop.com. Ruba from the Sudan episode makes these shirts, and if you would like one, go to the website. I wish they had like a Bosnia one. Thank you, Ruba. So I'm personally kind of excited for this one. But I think a while back, I did a DNA African test flag. and I made a video on it. I found shirts. out I have North African roots. Well, you literally can't get more North African than Tunisia. And if so, so these guys could be my incredibly long distant cousins. First of all, say hi to Sammy. Okay, he's going to be co-hosting with me. Hi guys, hi guys. Uh, I was thinking of doing a DNA test soon. Uh, there's like the 24 enemy or whatever and it shows your origins. The thing is, I'm kind of conflicted on whether to do it or not. One, it's $100, so it's going <laughs> to cost you a pretty penny to do just to do a DNA test. And secondly, I have a funny feeling it's just going to come out boring. Because, you know, people from the United States doing, they're like, oh, I'm part Cherokee or I'm part whatever, Lebanese or Iraqi, whatever. I bet mine is going to come back and I'm just like all Bosnian. Because <laughs> as far as I know, everybody in my family is from Bosnia. Uh, even people that have went and lived to live abroad, my family, they're still just marrying bo other Bosnians. Uh, it's just a pure Bosnian family if it comes out like oh you're from bosnia i'll be like no shit <laughs> or it's gonna say like i'm eastern european like where the slavs are from i don't know maybe maybe i should do it one day but i have a funny feeling it's gonna look very similar to a lot of other bosnians that have done 
DNA tests. And yeah, it also says like Eastern European, Balkan or whatever, but <laughs> I already know that. I want to see if there's something interesting about me and my part uh, Celtic, my part Hungarian somehow, or that would be interesting. But if it just comes out like, oh, you're a Slavic Illyrian, per oh, yeah, we already know that. So I don't know. Maybe I'll see. And uh, we also got Ahmed right here. How you doing? Good. How are you? He's going to be uh, doing some of the segments in the episode. <laughs> yeah, right? stay tuned for that. It's going to be great. Anything you guys want to say quickly about Tunisia before we start? Tahiyatunas. Long live Tunisia. I hope you guys like the episode. I hope we make it. Well, either he's well, tall Now that we have our small. two <laughs> Nisians, let's use our two knees to jump in now, shall we? Ooh, that oh, one, just that last one was bad. That mean I get to punch you? Go ahead. <laughs> Should have done it at the same time soon. Smash his face so, in. <laughs> quick side note, you guys, the entire continent of Africa actually gets its name from what Tunisia used to be called in Roman times, Africa. History here goes way beyond Roman times though. See, when it comes to history, Europeans are like, you have a 200 year old building and you think that's history? My bakery is older than that. But when Tunisians meet Europeans, it's like, Oh, you have a Roman ruin? <laughs> Try Carthaginian or Phoenician. Lots of landmarks in history here. Let's go to the map first, shall, shall we? we? <laughs> first of all, Tunisia is located in North Africa or the Maghreb region, which includes all the nations of Africa. I mean, it's just West in Arabic. In fact, Tunisia is the northernmost point of the entire African continent. Cape Angela or Ras Ben Saka, which is this entire jagged cliffy area right here. Now here's the interesting thing. The monument for the northernmost point is on this small westernmost peninsula. However, if you geolocate the coordinates, the unnamed middle peninsula just to the east of it is actually just a few meters further north. So not trying to piss off any Tunisian cartographers, but it's I'm just saying. That in any case, Tunisia also has rock. the northernmost so. island point in Africa as well. <laughs> the Galit Islands or Ile de Chien or Dog Islands, about 12 miles or 19 kilometers further there? north in the Mediterranean. Speaking of islands, Tunisia has quite a few off their coasts, including the largest island in all of North Africa. Jerba, which is connected to the mainland by this cool 4 mile or 6.5 kilometer causeway bridge. The country is made up of 24 governorates, each one named after their capital city, whereas the capital of the country and largest city is the aptly named Tunis, which also holds the largest and busiest oh, airport, just... Tunis Carthage International. It also holds the biggest and busiest shipping port of the country, the port of Tunis, and is famous for its elongated gullet, or gullet, which creates Lake Tunis with Fort Santiago of oh, Chipli, cool, an ancient actually. Roman citadel site that is only accessible by this incredibly long and narrow jetty, but unfortunately closed off to the public. The that crazy is thing cool is, just north city. of this point is the Punic port of Carthage, where the ancient ships would dock. Oh, that's one of my favorite looking ports of museum. all time. From there, the second and third largest cities are Sfax, just a bit further south, and Sus, in between Sfax and Tunis. Sus. Interestingly, though, the second and third busiest airports are actually Enfida Hamame International, close to Sus, and due to the high tourism demand, Jerba Zarzis International ranks in number three. Getting around so is mostly easy for the top half of the country. They have rail lines that extend all the way Don't inland mean to, sound to passive Kosur, and along the coast to Gab. From there, the road network becomes more sparse the further south you go until there is only one road, the partially unpaved C211, that goes all the way down to the tri point with Algeria it's and the Libya. Middle of okay, let's back up a few thousand years, shall we? Remember the Tonga episode we did two episodes ago? We mm -hmm. talked about thalassocracies or maritime empires. Well, Tunisia was essentially the hub of one of the oldest renowned thalassocracies in the world, the Carthaginian Empire. It was a North African <laughs> empire ruled by Punic people, but what are Punic people? They were Semitic of Phoenician origin, meaning that they came from the Levant and they colonized the coast of North Africa. So does that mean Tunisian people are Phoenicians? Eh, not quite, because later Carthage fell to Rome. Then are they Latin? Not quite, because then everything fell to Vandals, <laughs> Ottomans, Arabs, and the French. So what? Are they? We'll explain later in the episode, but long story Just, short, it's like it. <laughs> Arab, but eh, Arab. The coolest thing Berber is Arab. in Tunisia, you can see bits and pieces of all these historical eras meshed into their civil environment, including the mosque of Kairouan. It is oh, the oldest cool. Muslim and Arab base in the Maghreb, and it was the oldest mosque in the Maghreb as well. Some say it's like the fourth holiest site in Islam, but uh... Debatable. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's a complete casserole of influences. And with that, to explain a little bit more on the top notable sites of Tunisia, here's Ahmed to explain. Ahmed, come on in. First, the Medina of Tunis, which is basically the old part of the city. There are over 700 monuments and buildings that date back to the 12th century. It has Zituna, Medina which is a mosque and a university, supposedly the oldest Simply. in the world. 
Nope, mine is the oldest. Yeah, Morocco, maybe it was registered first, but ours was around before. Plus, it was founded by a Tunisian woman, uh, and it's literally called University of Karawiyin, which means people of Kairawen. So, I mean... Oh! <laughs> we also have the Bardo Museum, Gibili Oasis, Derba Synagogue. We also have ancient sites and ruins of Duga and Carthage. In Zagwen, we have Water Temple and Hanea. Fun fact, after the destruction of Carthage, Romans tried to put salt on the land so nothing would grow, but... Now we make the best olive oil in the world. <laughs> <laughs> There's also underground homes in Matmata, which by the way, Matmata was the site of Tatooine in Star Wars, and it's a tourist spot. So go check it out. And finally, I bet the jump, the so largest many tourists ancient go there just in Africa and also a UNESCO heritage site. And that's it for the famous sites. I'll see you guys later. Woo, thank you, Ahmed. Yeah, fun fact, the entire planet of Tatooine was named after Tatooine. Okay, so how did we get here from Carthage to filming of uh Star Wars. Well, it goes back all the way as we heard of the Punic people. Now, they were called the Punic people because uh, they knew of their origin were from Phoenician. The Romans knew their origin were Phoenician and they called the Phoenicians uh, the Punic to Sir people or something. And therefore the Punic Wars of which there were three. So Carthage was a well-known thelosocracy. As we know, they had amazing ships. They weren't really as warlike, like really warlike as the Romans were. The Romans were much more powerful on the land as opposed to the sea. I'll explain more of that, more on that in some other future episode where I do the Punic Wars, maybe by oversimplified. But basically, after the Roman Empire started to spread its influence, uh, at the same time the Carth Carthaginians were uh, along much of northern Africa, uh, that was the Carthaginian Empire, Thelosocracy, but Rome was also on the rise quickly. And they started butting heads on the island of S Sicily. They started to um, try to gain influence over, over each other. Now, uh, eventually the Romans won the First Punic War, uh, thanks in large because one of the very high-tech for its time, Carthaginian sheep, ships shipwrecked on the coasts of uh, the Italian peninsula, and the Romans found one of them and basically reversed engineered. Uh, the Romans were very, very good at copying other people groups' um, uh, cultures and or weapons. Even the Roman sword is based off of uh, the gladius, is based off of a, a Celtic sword, fun fact. So they copied their ships. But they still knew they couldn't uh, defeat Carthage on the seas. They were by far uh, more dominant on the seas. So they thought of a way they could fight. They could uh, bring the land fight on the seas. And this is where we get the Romans and their giant, like, how should I say, hooks on their ships that they would attach onto the enemy ships. And the Romans would then pass on to the uh, enemy's ships. And that's where the Romans were dominant. They were dominant on the land. Not that the... Carthaginians couldn't be good, but they didn't know really how to, so they fought on rough terrain in uh, when they were fighting on the mainland of Tunis, they were fighting on rough terrain, and they for some reason put their war elephants in the back, uh, but later on a Spartan warrior actually t told them, uh, put the elephants in the front and use them as a way to, disar to cause disarray amongst your enemies and fight on flat terrain etc. Long story short, they lost the First Punic War. Uh, the Romans were just outside of uh, Carthage at the time. Uh, the, the city of Carthage was basically right around where you would have the city of Tunis nowadays. But they decided to call it Tunis instead of Carthage. Personally, I think Carthage sounds cooler, but that's just me. They lost the First War. Uh, the Second War, Hannibal, one of, one of the most legendary generals of all time made it to the walls of rome and rome absolutely freaked out he made it across all the way from the alps losing one third of his army losing his eye in the swamps of the po valley all the way until he made it to uh rome not gonna lie kind of a giga chad <laughs> hannibal so but Hannibal, once he was at at the walls of rome he noticed the the city's defenses were very powerful so he asked uh, the main governor from Tunis or from Carthage at the time uh, to send more troops in, uh, but he never got gotten those troops. And instead, he tried to make more allies across the uh, Italian peninsula. But the Romans took their chances, and then they ended up making it to the capital of uh, Carthage at the time. And Hannibal was then died in exile. And the third and final Punic War, the Romans came out victorious. And uh, 
Carthagia de Lenda Est, as they would say it. Carthage must be destroyed in Latin. This is where they salted the earth or whatever. And so nothing could grow there ever again, so Carthage can never recover. Kind of brutal. Romans ended up taking over, naming it Africa. I always thought they named it after Scipio Africanus, which was the main rival to Hannibal at the time. Hannibal Barca. Uh, but apparently Africa would mean... We talked about this, I remember, in college, what, what Africa could possibly mean, because it was named by the Latin peoples, or the Romans. Uh, we assume it means dust, because you know much of Africa is dry, dusty. Eh, maybe, I don't know. It would be a kind of good explanation, but regardless, we know the Romans fell, the Vandals came in. Afterwards, uh, the Arabs or the Muslims start expanding rapidly but then fall apart after much uh, disarray and unrest. Then the Ottomans come in, creating the powerful Ottoman Empire. Well, before the Ottomans, there was the Byzantines, and then the Ottomans came in. Uh, actually, the Byzantines were even before the Arabs. Byzantines, then Arabs, then Ottomans. Okay, now I got my <laughs> facts right. And, uh, yeah, afterwards, the French came in, uh, the French left, um, and here we are today. It's a special country, I would say. Uh, where the Arab Spring happened, and of course where Star Wars was filmed at the Tatooine. That's about it. There you go. All that I know about Tunis. Tunisia. But don't be fooled by Star Wars. Not all of Tunisia is a desolate desert deathscape. They have quite a bit of greenery too. Let's discuss that and... They have forests even. So you probably already know the deal. To summarize, most of North Africa kind of goes like this. And yes. Tunisia is no exception. <laughs> There's actually a saying, Tunis al Khadra, which means Tunisia the green. We're getting ahead of ourselves. First, let's jump into the motion graphic. For one, Tunisia lies right on the convergence of the African and Eurasian plates. Within this plate system, they are wedged between the Maghrebid Front Fault Line and the South Atlas Front Fault. These are the fault lines that essentially create the entire Atlas mountain chain stretching from Morocco to Tunisia's Cape Bon Peninsula. In this mountain chain, you can also find the tallest peak, Jebel Shambi. From there in the south, you get the Great Eastern Erg, a land of sand dunes containing the Jabil National Park shielded by the Kassar Mountains. Essentially, like we've discussed many times before, this mountainous region juxtaposed to the humid Mediterranean acts as like a shield that captures all the moisture and in return creates a rain shadow effect that causes everything past the mountains to become dry and arid, hence the Sahara. This is why the northern part of Tunisia is noticeably greener with forested hills and mountains that can even foster snow caps in the winter, which means yes, Tunisia does have ski resorts. In the south, everything becomes rocky and dry and temperatures obviously rise. From the mountains, most of the rivers flow, mostly in the north, including the longest one, the Majorda River, which Not empties into the Mediterranean. In regards to the largest inland body of water, though, it depends it on what your check. classification stands on. If you're talking about the largest permanent lake that is not a lagoon connected to the ocean, many might claim Lake Ishkul or Ashkelon fits the bill, which is also a UNESCO heritage site. However, if you're talking about endorheic lakes, that is, seasonal lakes that dry up in the dry season, then of course we have to go to Shot el Jared, which means Palmland Lagoon. This Massive salt Looks pan empty. is the largest one in the Sahara oh. and fills up enough to ride boats in the winter months when mm. the water tributaries empty into it. When it dries back up, a thick salt crust covers the ground, so much to the point where you can walk and even drive on it sometimes. Because some maps show oh, it yeah. a lake. Shut up, Gotta love those disappearing endorheic salt lakes. It's one of nature's coolest magic tricks. Now you see it, now it's gone. In any case, as you can see, there is a Look wide my, range of lands in, my in wallet. Tunisia. <laughs> However, they do put a huge emphasis on maritime culture. Despite being a relatively dry nation, water is kind of like a theme in their identity and speaking of water you need water for a triple shot of espresso break and you know what that means Noah right comes here. in to <laughs> fill in for the rest of this segment take it away Noah let's roll you need like a fan something now fiscally speaking Tunisia had kind of a roller coaster situation going on in the 70s 80s and 90s for one they aren't too much of a resource dependent state sure at one point they were called the breadbasket of the Roman Empire and sure yeah. about 20 of their land is variable they usually basket. rank amongst the top 10 olive and date producers in the world and sure they have a small hydrocarbon industry with some natural gas deposits as well as crude oil wells inland and offshore but other than that Tunisia has needed more to move forward in other directions Eventually, 
Eventually, they privatized about 160 state-owned enterprises and entered an association agreement with the EU. Things were looking good, but then after the Arab Spring, extremist groups took advantage of the political situation and incited terror attacks, most notably at the Barnum Museum and Seuss Beach in 2015. This horrible event took a heavy blow to their tourism sector, the third largest in their economy. Nonetheless, Tunisia recovered as best they could. How so? By switching up primarily to the services sector. And how did they drive this sector? By putting a large portion of funds into education. At one point back in 2001, nearly one-fifth of their entire national budget was spent on education. They were the first country in the Arab world to use internet in 1992. And today, they often rank in the top for medical and software engineering fields in all of Africa. Tunisia is usually considered the premier health tourism destination in all of North Africa, and some claim, Ah, no, no, I know you're gonna say the whole Arab world. That's my title. Stay in your lane, okay? For what it's worth, though, of course tourism is their largest service industry. They have everything from beaches, to ski resorts, kind of like to Star Greece Wars film that sets. Get your like license buildings. ready. One more thing they capitalize off of, their national parks with wildlife. And to talk more on that, here's Gary Harlow. Let me crock your dial. So like most countries in North okay. Africa, Tunisia has two separate types of now my dials are cocked. The green rocky mountain types and the dry arid terrain types. The country has 17 national parks for wildlife conservation, the most famous one probably being Lake Ishkul or Ashkelon, a UNESCO heritage site famous for being a migratory bird hotspot. Every conceivable species of duck, goose and waterfowl can be found here, including flamingos, oyster catchers, ruffs and smew. You heard me, there's a bird called a smew. And that's how it sounds too, it just kind of smews at you. Smew. Nice Disapproving hairstyle. of you just like your great aunt. Smew. <laughs> <laughs> and just look at El Thaja National Park. Super green, totally underrated, and if you're lucky you might spot some of the rarest undulates. The Dama Gazelle. Not to be confused with the Drama Gazelle, which is my cousin Bert. He got a lot of issues man. It is said that you can find over 370 species of bird here, including the national bird, the cream colored corset. Otherwise, head south to the Sahara and you'll find the largest national park, Jabil. You've got fennec foxes, jackals, hyenas, cobras and horn vipers and Barbary sheep, which are all endemic. And if you're lucky, you might spot the super rare Attix. Finally, also known in the Southern area, are horses. The local Berber community has quite an equestrian based culture that involves Pharisee events and shows. And speaking of horses, it's time for you to meet her. Giddy up on out of here. Cheerio, mates. Thank you, Gary. And to add to the animals, Tunisians love seafood. They definitely like the fish off those coasts. You know what's coming up. We're going to discuss the food of Tunisia. Bring on and the with couscous. that, let's go back to Sammy and Ahmed. First off, we love carbs. Woo! It is said that we are the second largest consumer per capita on pasta after Italy. Some will claim Tunisia is probably has the spiciest cuisine in the Arab world. I love spicy. And this is the poof. It's the best harissa in the world. In any case, some of our top dishes might include things like brik, which is a pastry with egg and tuna, frikassé, which is savory donut, mlewi, of course. Oh, donut. that's my favorite, my personal favorite. And there's also that, like, a fugu, bread. which is I love it. Ahmed's favorite. And finally, the trifecta of Tunisian cuisine, specifically for the weddings couscous. and special <laughs> occasions, the tagine couscous de sladam shuya. Yeah, Tunisian tagine is basically quiche. And our version of couscous usually contains seafood like sea bream or squid. So that's it for octopus. our food. You guys should try it. Thank you. Also, a little side note, Tunisia has a noticeable wine growing region and they do brew beer. It's actually an old tradition that dates back to the Carthaginian times. Well, that's all I got for you. Until next time, stay tuned and stay ready. Thank you, Noah. By the way, Sammy, what's your favorite Tunisian dish? Fricasse, kafteji, leblebi. That's pretty interesting. Mm. There's can your harissa? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the best in the world. Try it. I think it's actually expired. Well, so far you've probably picked up the variables <laughs> that make it. up Tunisia as a state and as a landmass. Only one ingredient left to this recipe, the people. Tunisians. So, Sami Ahmed, what is a Tunisian person? Ooh, that's a tough one. Person from Tunisia. Tunisia. has a deep knowledge of, like, about the Arabs and Africans, Europeans, and even Americans, but 
none of them understand his culture uh we're kind of arabs but not quite because we are so diverse and mixed and we keep our traditions from a long time ago so we could be aliens as far as i know <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we're out of this world so uh tunisians are just kind of tunisians it's like that's the best way to describe you guys we're just people <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> well no if way. we must break the nation down demographically here's how we do it tunisia has a population of about 12 million people and was recognized as one of the freest and open countries in the arab world the country claims Claims to be Chad. about 98% Arab or sometimes kind Arab Berber, <laughs> depending on who you talk to. Genealogy records and DNA tests have revealed that it is speculated that within the group of Arabs, about 60% are said to have some degree of native North African Berber or Amazigh ancestry within their heritage. The Arab title, though, is complicated because it doesn't pertain to any specific ethnic group, but rather just people that speak Arabic and have an Arab identity, whatever that may be. From there, about 1% claim to actually be Berber or Amazigh, and the remaining 1% are other groups, mostly Europe. European. So we use the Tunisian dinar as our currency and we use the type C and E plug outlets and we drive on the right side. Good. Of the so let's talk about language. That's how you know the English Most Tunisians there. are at least bilingual with the official language Arabic as well as French which is used from schools from elementary and up. Yeah, we study French from second grade and English from third grade. In high school, all subjects are on, in French. So in high school, everything is in French? Yes. Do you speak a any Arabic in high school? Just the one Arabic subject. Just Arabic subject and is few others like the religion oh like religion like okay well regarding the arabic language um if they were to speak in every like arab dialect were to speak in their proper dialect like you would have moroccan or yemeni or gulf arab or i don't know egyptian arab and they would speak their genuine you know dialect some some would say they they cannot even understand each other at all and they, they would nearly count that as different types of Arabic language. Uh, however, if they uh, spoke the literary Arabic language, they could then understand each other. So that's as far as I could understand regarding the Arabic language and its many dialects. In a sense, yes, they can understand each other, but in another sense, no, they can't really understand each other. So. Mm, that's why I would just call the Tunisians Tunisians. Okay. Yeah, philosophy. Yeah, philosophy. So. Nonetheless, with Arabic, Tunisians actually have their own distinct Tunisian dialect. It's often described as like sing songy, difficult to understand. If I waited one the second. The dialect is actually paid close to the Maltese language. <laughs> to explain more, uh, Ahmed, come on in. Why don't you explain about the language? And uh, we'll add another geography with him. Okay, guys. Look, so let's talk about our dialect. So Tunisians sometimes use very old school Arabic words, and we also mix up French, Spanish, Italian and Amazigh. For example, Barsha is an OG Arabic word and it basically just means a lot. So our word sounds sexier and I like that. Barsha. In Amazigh, we say fakroon, which means turtle. In Spanish, we say sabat, which means a shoe. Like sapato. Italian, we use carrita, meaning a horse wagon. Oftentimes, we take French words but conjugate them in our own way. For example, like for example, the word exam, we usually use the French word, which is examen, but with a slight twist for the plural word. We take the plural ed suffix from the Arabic and stick it on the French word examen, and it becomes examinet. To say, I need to study because I have to take many exams this semester. In Tunisian, we'd say, As you can see, we use the French letters to write it and with number to substitute the letters that have no equivalent in French. 9 for Qa, 3 for A, just because they look like the Arabic letters. I also used word very known to be Tunisian, like Khatar, because Barsha, so many. Thank you. One thing that kind of makes Tunisia stick out is that although nominally we are primarily Arab, we are also kind of like the mixed descendants of all empires. Which means they don't have a sense of typical Arab tribalism. The social sector has kind of allowed us to walk the fine line between what is deemed acceptable in Arab conservatism versus westernized values. It's an identity crisis. Basically. Tunisia is often designated by outside sources as the freest country in the Arab world and most open to civil equality. Oftentimes, they're also kind of considered the most open to Western values in the Arab world as well. Bet a lot of you guys were thinking of me. Keep in mind, the keyword was Western values. A lot of people seem to conflate that term with modern development, which is not necessary or mutually exclusive to that term. Oh, yeah, Just keep that in mind. Japanese is, is modern, been but hardly Western. Many other moments in the Arab world, having the oldest constitution in the Arab world, we were the first to abolish slavery. They were also the first nation in the Arab world that allowed women to file for divorce and receive inheritance, pass on nationality to children. And 
uh, first to allow a woman to. Technically, you mean by the Quran, you are allowed to divorce. Yeah, women are allowed to divorce in the Quran, but it's only in very special circumstances, to be honest, to be fair. Uh, so, yeah, technically that, that was allowed, as far as I know. I don't know. Uh, any Muslim scholars down there, write in the comments if I'm correct or not. But, um, yeah, regarding the Arab Spring, he's probably going to get to it, and it's probably a bit controversial, so I don't know if Paul's going to mention a lot, but basically, this one guy who was selling fruit, I believe, around the 2010s, he self-immolated himself, meaning he's set fire to himself uh, in protest because uh, the government was, like, just, like, increasing taxes or something at an exorbitant rate, and he just couldn't, could no longer, you know, provide for himself or his family anymore and he resorted to that and that caused a absolute national outcry and therein started the arab spring with the hope of you know toppling their very autocratic governments and exchanging them with democratic ones like we would see in uh, i don't know the u.s or france or something that uh failed <laughs> we can say failed horribly the the, the autocrats that were toppled were replaced with other autocrats. So, Unfortunately for them, it didn't seem to work out at all. But As well yeah. as even marrying outside of the Muslim faith. Legally, women are allowed to wear almost anything from hijabs to bikinis. However, recently after XMS attacks, they put a ban on full face and body veils. Today, women also make up about 30% of their parliament. So yeah, there's a lot of female stuff happening in Tunisia. We're proud of it. We like it. Female stuff. Yay. Although some of these rights were around long ago, many of them were spurred by the 2010 Tunisian or Jasmine Revolution, which ousted former President Ben Ali. This was the trigger moment that sparked the Arab Spring. You've probably heard of it. It basically went down like this. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, Tunisia was also kind of the only country to have had relative success after their revolution. Every other country that took part in the Arab Spring, except for Bahrain, pretty much fell into civil war. Now, it hasn't been clear mm. and smooth sailing for Tunisia either. Our economy took a hit and we've had like five presidents in 10 years. So uh, they're kind of like still in the experiment stage, figuring things out. But overall, they mostly achieved the legislative objectives that they wanted. Yeah, we could go on on this topic, but we have to move on. Religion! Within the constitution, Islam is the state religion and about 98% of the country identifies as Muslim, about 60% of that group claiming to be Sunni. The constitution does allow freedom of religion and respects cultures that have played a role in their history and cultural identity. You can find some churches mostly in Tunis and there are about 2,000 Jews still living in Tunisia, about two-thirds of which can be found on Jerba Island, which has Africa's oldest synagogue. And a lot of Jews take a pilgrimage over there, right? Yes. Like every year, it's like a thing they do. Well, one other thing Tunisians make pilgrimages to are stadiums whenever a sporting event occurs. To talk about that, here's Art with the sports part. Oh, hi. I didn't <laughs> see you there. I guess it's time for the sports part with Art. Terminally ill with ginger. So when it comes to athletics, it pretty much goes without saying. Tunisians are the best swimmers in the Arab world. Arab Thanks to their ginger. maritime culture and access to swimming facilities, Tunisians know how to get around the old splish splash, splishity splu, whatever you want to call it. Today, they've racked up three gold medals and one bronze in swimming events at the Olympics, more than any other Arab nation. This guy, Usama Malouli, won two gold medals and has competed in every Olympic from Beijing to Tokyo. He's a big deal. And what goes better with water than a beach? And what can you find at a beach? Volleyball! Tunisia is today ranked number one in Africa with 11 African championships in men's volleyball. Also, this Tunisian woman right here is the number one ranked African and Arab female tennis player. She won her biggest title to date in the 2022 Madrid Open, a WTA 1000 event. This made her the first Tunisian and Arab player in the world to win at that level. Finally, you can not talk sports in Tunisia without bringing up soccer or football. Everyone in Tunisia pretty much supports one of these four teams right here. Their national team, the Eagles of Carnage. <laughs> carnage. Carthage. Eagles carnage. of Carnage. That's like the medal. Their <laughs> national team, the Eagles of Carthage, has won the Africa Cup, the African Nations Championship, and the Arab Cup. They've qualified for FIFA six times, with their highest rank being ninth back in 1978 in Argentina. So that's uh, pretty much it, and I gotta go. So. 
<laughs> Thank you, Thank Art. You. <laughs> a sample table. Yeah, it's crazy. Like the theme of water keeps kind of popping up in Tunisia, and like every like we just learned, swimming is a huge part of your culture. Yes. Like, like it's big. Oh, Ahmed, what is this thing you are wearing? That's a Tunisian thing. What is it? Explain, Sami. It's a shashia. It's our traditional. Oh, not a fez. Oh, it looks good on you. Yeah, you'll find this in Tunisia. Looks like a wide so fez. It's mostly for special occasions. Well, to explain a little bit more on the culture and stuff like that, here is random Hannah. I love this. <laughs> 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 Hi guys, I am back, your favorite host on Geography. Part time so, sumo wrestling. Tanita coach. has a lot yeah, going totally. on. First thing you need to know the jasmine flower. It's the national flower and used in like so many ways. Often, a mesh moon or I small bouquet it. of jasmine <laughs> flowers will be worn by a man to symbolize that he is single and ready to mingle. At special events, people really? might wear the traditional clothing. Tunisians are all about fashion. Jalabas and dendries are popular unisex garments. But for women, there are way more options because every major region has their own traditional dress. Architecture is very distinct. Many homes and buildings will have the traditional bob door, which usually has a rounded arch top, vivid colors, and adorned with symmetrical metal bolt patterns or arabesque Did Bob carving. make one of those? You will also <laughs> notice many of the shutters are painted blue. This is done for both beauty and to ward off evil spirits. In fact, the visual arts have always been Tunisia's strong point. They are world renowned for their carpets, handicrafts, and pottery. In fact, in the town of Sheznan, there is a rare 3,000 year old terracotta sculpting technique of pottery still practiced by the women in the village. And speaking of art, film, that's my specialty. And Tunisia has a lot going on. Tunisians love cinema so much, they even have their annual Carthage Film Festival. This is the oldest of its kind in Africa, started in 1966. It's designed to promote and uplift African film as well as Arab films. Many Tunisian movies were nominated for Oscars and took part in the Cannes Film Festival. I actually just went there and I'm gonna make a little video on it so subscribe to my YouTube channel. During Ramadan every year, the people watch these TV shows. These are their classics. Movies like these have made waves across the Arab world. The Silences of the Palace was a highly acclaimed film set in the 1950s. It addressed issues that women faced during the time. And Dasra, Tunisia's first horror movie. So many good movie stuff. Speaking of festivals, Arabic the largest horror, one that, that takes place in the country is the world-renowned International Festival of Carthage. It takes place in the actual Roman amphitheater. This is basically Tunisia's Super Bowl. And that's just one festival. They have so many others. And of course, you can't have a festival without music, which ugh, keep. <laughs> ah, yeah, guys, sorry, Keith is busy with his job in Florida. Uh, we need to have a substitute. Uh, who else here knows music? Mm. Oh, Gabs! Keith, we miss you, and we're gonna do this episode without you and your beautiful mm. long hair. Looks like Keith is slowly <laughs> leaving them. Tunisia! Let's talk about the tunes of Nisia. <laughs> Oh. So like we explained already, Tunisian music is reflective of all the cultural influences they've been through. Andalusian, Turkish, Persian, Greek, French, and of course, Arab. Today they have even a national artistic institution that specializes in teaching and preserving Tunisian music. Go there! And if you ask any Tunisian person what is distinctively Tunisian music, well for one, Tunisians tend to add the violin a lot more to their music and typically they will mix it with their traditional instruments and songs. As for genres, most of them will probably focus on two things. Malouf, which is the traditional classic music which is usually played at weddings, this has a South Spanish influence to it. Many Muslims from Spain migrated to North Africa in the 15th century and brought it with them. This style usually mixes fast string plucking on the oud guitar with violins, drums, and slow passionate vocals. What's the fastest you can pluck, Gabs? I can do this thing that's like kind of Spanish-y where it's like... No, I can't. No, okay. <laughs> Keith, I can't take your place, man. The second style would probably be being Mizwad. The style is named after the instrument, the Mizwad or Tunisian bagpipe. Yes, they have bagpipes here. It has a single reed and is made of goat leather. Mizwad music is faster, cats. more upbeat, and is usually it. accompanied by the traditional Darbuka drum. Mizwad even has its own style of dance and is said to make people enter into a trance-like state when they're listening to it. Who doesn't love falling really? in trances? You like falling in trances? I sure as hell do not. What are we implying here? <laughs> Mizwad is such a popular style of music that it even made its way into contemporary Tunisian pop and rap music. Otherwise, here are some of the top musicians and music artists you guys, the Tunisian geography peeps, <laughs> also suggested we mention in the video. So much to say about them, but we don't have time. If you are Tunisian and want to add to this list or 
tell us something cool about the artist, let us know. Write it in the comments. Or not. Hate us. Love us. <laughs> We're still be here. And finally, right Metal has creeped its way into said. Tunisia and has seen a steadily growing community. Gotta say, I Keith. checked out this band. Definitely don't know how to pronounce it. They have a really Inigar. cool folk metal style that mixes traditional Tunisian instruments with violins oh, <laughs> and of course metal guitars. Pretty awesome. Uh oh. I gotta go. See you guys. You don't even professionally play the drum, do you? Every Tunisian knows these things. Yeah. <laughs> well, we covered a lot. Born so much drums. of Tunisia is built off of history and outside influences. But how do outsiders today see Tunisia and influence them? Let's find out. Next segment. Let's go. So, okay, as a super diplomatic country, obviously, Tunisia has a lot of relations that either go way back or are recent. Let's just jump into the motion graphic, shall we? So first of all, as a member of numerous IGOs like the Arab League, African Union, and the Arab Maghreb Union, Tunisia is pretty much the mediator between much of the Arab world and even the African continent. There was even a time when Cote d'Ivoire was having domestic issues and was unable to host the African Development Bank. So who took over the reins for 11 years? Tunisia. Outside of Africa, though, Tunisia is one of the U.S.'s oldest African diplomatic partners with relations dating back over 200 years. The American Friendship Treaty was signed in 1799. Things like trade, tourism, and joint military exercises have been a part of the relationship since then. On that note, France, of course, has a special relationship with them as well due to their history and shared linguistic skills. Also, France hosts the largest Tunisian community in diaspora at over 1 million. Numerous business and government connections have been established after independence. France is their largest export and import partner, and many French companies have also relocated to Tunisia, which helps them with a little bit of an economic boost. Italy and Malta are pretty close too. They are just a skip away, and historically many South Italians and Tunisians have migrated to each other's lands and intermarried, and the Maltese language being derived from Tunisian Arabic is just one hint that shows how close they have been throughout the centuries. Now if you want to talk about inner circle, you have to go back to North Africa. On a political level, they've had their ups and downs with Egypt since the 50s when they criticized the Arab Union thing that Egypt tried to incite. Things got really good after the Arab Spring, but then the coup d'etat in Egypt strained things again. But then Tunisia's Nida Tunis move movement improve things all over again, so up and down, up and down. Now, Tunisians love Libya, however, Libya is kind of like the country that they'd like to make memes about and poke fun at for a little <laughs> bit. Like Egypt, they've had their up and down moments, whether like it was Gaddafi related, Balkans. oil related, or just Libya trying to take over the town of Gafsa in 1980. But overall, Tunisia Why? decided to lift sanctions and normalize trade to bolster relations. When it comes to their best friends, though, almost every Tunisian I have talked to has said Algeria. Algeria. Both of them have shared every moment of their history together, dating back to the Punic Phoenician era, and today they go hand in hand. They signed the Treaty of Fraternity and Concord in 1983. They do lots of trade and business. They intermarry a lot. And overall, these two have been mostly backing each other up nonstop since day one. It's just a little complicated because Tunisia is also friends with Morocco, Morocco but Algeria <laughs> yeah. and Morocco on paper have that little dispute over the Sahrawi people's claim in Western Sahara. However, aside from all that, Moroccans and Tunisians as people get along pretty well and enjoy each other's company. It's just, you know, don't don't talk about the Polisario thing. All so right, so in sorry. conclusion, you guys are the Tunisians. Ahmed, take my mic and speak from the heart. Go. How would you conclude this episode? Go. I'm looking for that word. In conclusion, we're a small country, but we have a lot to offer. True. <laughs> <laughs> Even those little things, the dumb shit we do, I, I, I like it. Do you know what I like the most about Tunisia? It's those little contradictions. Muslims, but liberal. We're, we're Arabs, but Europeanized. We have great food. We Europeanized great Arabs. Dishes. I don't okay. know. It's just a great country. Look it up. Woo, Tunisia! Yes, Tunisia! Uh, thank you guys. Turkey is coming up next. And don't confuse our flags. Yeah, don't. <laughs> I was going to hey just talk about that. Oh, just click there. I was going to just talk about that. Um, a one, you know, red flag is that they have similar flags. Get get what I did there? Red flag because they're red. Yeah, whatever. But uh, they have, yeah, similar flags, except the Tunisian symbol looks different. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Flag Slash Fan Day. I know a lot of you guys don't even watch these videos, but it's not about I the do. views. It's about following the same format people? until we get to the end. Oh, 88,000. We'll Tunisia oh. episode. As you know, this is the part where we address the uh, small mistakes in the video or the things that we didn't have time to mention in the video. For one, in the political geography motion graphic, there was a small little glitch in which the train stop labels of Tozor and Gab didn't show up. In the physical geography motion graphic, the longest river, the Majera, actually ends around here, not here. Also, I accidentally also, used a picture yeah. of Morocco. 
Moroccan musicians instead of Tunisian in the music segment. Sorry. <laughs> also, Geography Khalil really wanted ah, to be in fine. this video. He wanted to do the famous places section, but it's like I kind of promised Ahmed he could do it because he wasn't going to co-host. So I was like, you can have the segments. So Khalil, I'm sorry you couldn't be in the video, but thank you Khalil for still trying to volunteer. Things we forgot to mention. Tunisia has a huge hammam culture. Now, hammams used to be very popular throughout most of the Islamic Turkish world, partially path. because they have to do the ablution thing before going into a mosque. However, the popularity kind of died down in most of the countries, but it's still popular in Tunisia. In fact, during Tunisian weddings, they usually like rent out an entire hammam just for the bride and her friends. Another thing we didn't mention, at one point in Tunisia, they spoke a language called African Romance. Don't have time to get into it, but it was Latin based. At one point, Tunisia had more Italians than French people. So the French put up propaganda posters saying, we need to Frenchify Tunisia. And in the language section, Geography Psara briefly mentioned how Arabs have this thing called Arabizi. It's like their texting language. And Tunisians kind of use it a lot in which they use the Latin alphabet and they use numbers to signify letters in the Arabic alphabet that don't have a French equivalent. So it's like nine is ka, three speak is in ah. Arabic. I can't pronounce that very ah, 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 too hard for me. So that's about it. If there's anything else I forgot to mention, please put it in the comments. Otherwise, we got to move on. So without further ado. <laughs> I miss when it was just flag slash fan Friday. No, the yeah, alliteration I was say, nice. Uh, get your Geography Now merch at geographynow.com. Oh, I got it right here. Don't worry. Brand. <laughs> Nothing in here, just fake sipping for the camera. I'm gonna put this down. Ah, Tunisia, the land of... Also, his cup has a circular and since base. I have North nose. African roots, that means technically I could be related to Hannibal, but then technically I'm also related to Scipio Africanus Barbatus, who defeated Hannibal. So I'm basically the ancestor of enemy ancestors that killed each other. The I enemy of my exist. enemy is my ha! descendant. In case we're getting off topic, let's talk about the flag. So this is a very short and simple one. The flag is a red banner with an emblem made of a white disc in the center with a red crescent and star in the middle of said disc. The crescent and star obviously stand for Islam, the state religion. The white disc symbolizes peace, whereas the red of the flag stands for... Really? Thank you, Potts, our favorite Irishman, for making that animation. I just told him, somehow put an octopus in there because, you know, <laughs> Tunisia loves seafood. So, you know, throughout history, Tunisia has been under a bunch of other flags. When they're under French protectorate status, they still use their own flag, but sometimes there's the French tricolor in the corner. Otherwise, prior to this, they were under a bunch of other sultanates, kingdoms, dynasties, and caliphates. During Ottoman times, they were under the Bay of Tunis, which was like, a bay is, was like a noble ruler yeah, within the Lord. Ottoman stuff. I don't know, the flag was cool. It had a bunch of colors and like a double dagger thing. I'm not going to go into detail for everyone. It's going to take too long. And plus, blah, blah, blah. You get the point. I'd be shocked if any of you guys are even still watching. Anyway, let's move on to the coat of arms. The coat of arms is quite more detailed than the flag. A yellow shield with lots of imagery. On top of the shield is the central emblem of the national flag, obviously standing for Tunisia. In the top center of the shield is a Punic galley, an ancient ship that not only alludes to their ancient Punic roots, but is also considered a, ship, a symbol uh, of freedom. The on the bottom or, right is a lion Roman holding copied. a sword, which symbolizes order. On the bottom left is a weighing scale which symbolizes justice and in the center Scales just justice. under the ship is the three word national motto written in Arabic freedom order and justice and prior to this they had like three other former coat of arms when they're under the Hussein dynasty and the Bay of Tunis and uh yeah that is uh that's just about it short sweet and simple and spicy just like their harissa still got the can Sammy I gotta open this up and try it sometime soon harissa all right that means you know what time it is it's time the for G end of the video okay so I'll be the next video should be Turkey. I know a lot have been a lot have been uh, expecting that one for a long time now, but wait no longer. It should be out just right after this video, a few days, give or take. And uh, I'll see you guys some other time. And as always, take care.